Hi everybody, how you doing? Welcome to the latest episode of From the Rock to the Cloud. We are well into season two and as always uh, we're going to talk about everything from the rock to the cloud uh, and everything in between. Um, yeah, it's in the name. Um, so we're lucky enough as always to not be stuck just with me talking a load of codswallop um, but we've actually also managed to rope in an expert or two um, and this time we've got somebody who well um what time is it where or where you are what time is it because you're on the other side of the planet aren't you you're in australia yeah it's uh quarter to eight in the evening <laughs> wow so um we, not only are we lucky enough to have an expert and i'm going to let him introduce himself in a second um but but this is an expert who's staying up late for you guys so that he can tell you all about technology which is i mean to be honest he, he doesn't have to do this i should have got up earlier but no he stayed up late for us anyway so oren um, not only are you an officiado of uh well pretty much anything um techie but you're also an officiado of pretty much anything geeky and um we had a pre-chat and this pre-chat by the way has gone on like must be must be nearly an hour before the call, which is crazy. But and we've got a lot of things that we enjoy: uh, Warhammer, uh, Star Trek, Star Wars, like you name it. Um, but you you've got it all as well. So I'm totally in awe of your collection. I mean, look at that Star Destroyer behind you, um, amazing. But anyway, we're not here to talk about our geeky fetishes. Um, we are here to talk about Windows Server. So Oren, just um, for those people that don't know you, if you could just do a quick intro and tell people why we've got the privilege of talking to you today. Why? Because you bloody well asked. Um, but, um... <laughs> fair, fair. That, that's so fair. Yeah, that's fair. Question, is the question sort of more who I am and what are my qualifications? Um, you, well, so, yeah, um, but not like in a resume kind of way. <laughs> um, so what I'm probably mostly known for is writing an obscene number of books. I'm somewhere on my... 43rd at this point so i've passed the douglas adams number of 42 um mostly around uh microsoft it operations space i am also a cloud advocate at microsoft and what that means is that i have now shifted inside microsoft i'm still writing books as part of a side gig but uh the we're responsible for it's advocating to and advocating on behalf of an audience. And what that actually means is that we reflect the audience into Microsoft and we also reflect Microsoft out to the audience. And the difference might be from the old technical evangelists is that we create a lot of our own content to fill gaps that exists within Microsoft's documentation ecosystem or presentation ecosystem that actually meets the needs of who we see as our audience. And obviously, as someone who's written for the IT pro audience for sort of 20 years or so, I have a very definite audience as a cloud advocate of people that are very engaged often with Windows Server and security to a certain extent. And so I try and create content that really scratches the itches that they need scratched rather than necessarily yeah. just presenting a, there's other aspects of Microsoft that are very good at talking about what's new, what the features are, you know, what products do in that way. And then there's the rest of us who sort of, um, or this is small group of us as cloud advocates who really, because we're embedded with the audience, we're sitting there going, well, these are the itches. These are the real world problems that the audience has that they don't know how to solve with a Microsoft technology. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk to them about how they do solve that and actually yeah meet them where they are rather than sort of preach to them about where we want them to be. And or that that is um and that's a great introduction, but also I I love the approach of that, which is not to preach. Um and that's kind of like the whole premise of this um I don't even know what it is. Um I I keep calling it a podcast, but it's not because it's on video, so it's 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 a vlog. Um but it, this is this is this is scratching an itch. That's what this is. This is just literally um you know let's talk about things that actually are interesting and um, hopefully other people find interesting so today we're going to talk about um and this is your terminology and obviously you're the expert and you know you've got like 43 books so um who am i to question it server hardening um so <laughs> server hardening and data and securing data now i get conceptually what that means um but windows server 
secu- is it secure by default? Like, I mean, you, you know, let's 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 talk about that. Like, let's talk about why why we're talking about this today. Okay, so one of the things to really understand, just given the breadth of the number of customers that use Windows Server, is that when you're going to ship an operating system like this, you've got to make a lot of decisions. So you go and put a whole lot of security controls into the operating system. And you put those security controls in, but you've got to decide which ones to turn on and which ones not to turn on. And when you are dealing with a lot of, very rarely are you deploying into a greenfield environment. Quite often you're deploying into an environment, you might be deploying into an Active Directory environment that's been there since Windows 2000. You might have servers that are running a variety of operating systems. So each one of these security controls that you might or you might not enable is a choice. So by default, Windows Server is as secure as it can be made to maintain what is a reasonable level of compatibility with what our customers expect. And sometimes we'll sit there and announce, hey, it won't work with blah, because we've disabled this by default, like SMB uh, 1 is disabled by default in Windows Server 2022, but it was not disabled by default, say in Windows Server 2012. So by saying it's secure is that there's a lot more that you can do to secure windows server than the just the default installation but the, yeah. what we've put you in a position of doing is that you have to make those decisions and you have to turn on those controls or enable those controls based on the realities of your environment because if we turned on everything it probably wouldn't work in your environment <laughs> yeah it's true so no, it, um, it, it, so it, that's what no, I, I was just going to say, like, ultimately, kind of what you're saying is actually there is an onus of responsibility around security on the the company, individual or person setting up using the environment and the service that and the, and the services that they want to use. And but what we're now doing is giving you the choice of what we have and giving you our best kind of shot of what it is off the bat. Um, and then you can kind of then configure it and make it personal. Well, it's it's a matter of understanding that each security control that you enable has, yeah. you know, it's like throwing a stone into a pond. There's ripples that go everywhere. And it may be that you turn the control on and everything continues to work. Or it may be that suddenly a critical workload that you weren't aware of or that you were only marginally aware of had a particular dependency actually ceases to function. So security okay. hardening is very much a process of you know, turning one dial at a time rather than turning all of the knobs to 11 and hoping that the thing still works. Okay. And, you know, what is the easiest way to be, I suppose, as secure as possible, given um, kind of what we've just discussed? What's the easiest way to be as secure as possible with Windows Server to, today? What, what, you know, what, how, what, so, what would you recommend? So, look, um, the, in, in short, run the latest version of the operating system and have your latest security updates installed. So that's that's obviously just a motherhood <laughs> statement, right? It's so, so obvious, but what's very interesting is if you go out and look at environments, there's environments like, and the first thing you should always upgrade in any environment is your domain controllers, right? Because your domain controllers are what any attacker wants to get dominance over. Because if an attacker owns your domain controllers, they can do anything on your network because they control authentication and authorization. So it's very interesting that a lot of organizations are still sitting there on domain controllers that are running, in some cases, unsupported versions of Windows Server. Uh, whereas what should happen is when a new version of Windows Server comes out, that should be the first thing that you deploy. You should go through and deploy new versions of your domain controllers because nothing else should be running on a domain controller other than Active Directory domain services and maybe of the DNS server that goes in with it. You certainly shouldn't be running an application where you're worried about application compatibility on your domain controller. So um, that's the, the, the simplest way. Make sure you've got the most secure, uh, the most recent version of the operating system. That's a good start. And um, Windows Server 2022 launched um, and we made some big announcements around Secure Core. Um, Would you say that it's always good to have that, you know, if you can use that configuration, should you always use that and deploy that configuration? So there's a couple of things. There's Secure Core and there's Server Core. 
So okay. the first one is to understand with server core, that's the version of Windows Server that doesn't ship with the desktop environment. So it's okay. all of that desktop environment stuff taken off. And it's been around probably since 2008. Uh, but a lot of people don't deploy Windows Server in the server core uh, configuration. In fact, when you deploy Windows Server, the default option is to deploy the standard version of Windows Server in server core. And everybody goes and goes standard with a GUI or data center with a GUI, depending on what license they've got. So okay. the first thing is make sure that you're using, if you can, server core. Now you talk about something, you talk about something that's slightly new, which is secure yeah. core. Now secure core is where you've got hardware attestation and then you can go and build basically policies on top of that that allow you to use that hardware attestation to authorize which software runs on the operating system. And there's been various iterations of this technology over the years. If you go back, you had things called software restriction policies and you had app locker policies, and then you had yeah. code integrity policies. And they've all been sort of sitting there basically coming up with a way to make sure that that application or that code that's running right now is authorized <coughs> to run on the system. And it's identified in a, a cryptographically appropriate way that makes sure that you know there's not a false positive there that just because you name something you know app.exe it is actually the app that you want to allow to run rather than a bit of yeah. malware that someone's dropped on your system is trying to get to execute so um with server core um again one of the things to understand about server core is that it's a remote first administration paradigm the idea is that most administrators should not be RDPing into a server, firing up a management console on the server and doing whatever they need to do. What they should be doing is they should be making some form of remote connection to that server and administering the server in that way. Because okay. we all know that there's been many uh, cases where servers are compromised simply because someone has remoted into a domain controller, for example. They've got bored, they've opened up a web browser, they're suddenly browsing a third party website on the domain controller, some malware drops so, on or, the domain controller. Or how would you how would you protect those domain controllers then? What steps? So would you with take? domain domain controllers, the first thing is the make sure it's the most recent version of Windows Server. Make sure that your domain <laughs> controllers are running server core. Make sure that you've enabled um, Secure Core if it's appropriate for that, in, uh, if you've got the appropriate hardware, but then turn on Device Guard or Windows Defender Application Control or Code Integrity Policies. It's fairly straightforward to go and say, I only want to allow signed binaries from Microsoft and authorized scripts to run on this domain control. What you want to do is you want to block anybody basically putting together their own script and then running their own script. So you want to have signed scripts and only allow signed yeah. scripts to run on that DC. The other thing that you should do is you should block the <coughs> DC from being able to directly communicate with any host on the internet. So that the DC should never be able to connect directly to the internet, that you've got firewall rules sitting at your perimeter that block that DC yeah. from making that connection. And when you're doing software updates on that DC, they're coming from a WSUS server that's sitting somewhere else on the network and that you're really restricting which host that DC can reach out to. Um, you should make sure that admin sessions to the DC are only allowed from known privileged access workstations or jump servers. So you shouldn't allow anybody to RDP across to the DC from any workstation. There, there should be a specific workstation or a specific jump server used to do that. Simply because again, what you want to avoid is you will want to avoid, you know, Bob or Sally, the sysadmin, sitting there using their own personal laptop that they take home and that they do whatever the heck they want on because they've got local admin privileges and then RDPing into a secure server using that. They, they almost should, and it's obviously much more expensive in hardware, be going across to a separate computer that is lock, as locked down because you don't want someone to be hopping from that privileged workstation onto the thing that they're connecting to. And there's been many attacks where the way that the attack has occurred is that they've attacked the administrator's computer and then use that access to then get into the secure thing that they really wanted to attack. That makes sense. So it's about sort of, I suppose, creating those, it's like an onion, isn't it? It's like putting the, putting the, yeah. the layers on an onion. 
to protect to protect that. Yeah, and uh, with, you know, security, that with security, there is no one thing that you can do that will absolutely protect yeah. your network or your 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 host. What you're doing is you're sitting there. You're you as you said, you're adding layers of security to make it much more difficult. Um, it's sort of like Maxwell Smart, where Maxwell Smart went yeah. through all of those doors and each one of those was a security barrier. Uh, they didn't all open at once. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to make it much more difficult for your attacker to attack. It's again like a safe. A safe doesn't stop someone from stealing what's inside the safe, yeah. but most safes are rated based on how long it would have take a competent lock picker or safe cracker to actually get into the safe. Yeah, and even before you get to the safe, you've got to get past the security guard. You've got to get like you've got to get to the safe, right? And I think that's kind of what we're talking about. So if we if we think about, um, I suppose those admin accounts and um, hardening the authentication, what what would you suggest people go do from a steps perspective to make sure that authentication process is as bulletproof as possible? So there's a couple of things that you can do with Windows Server. Um, Eventually, you should get to the point, and this is one of those sh ships by default. So Windows Server ships by default with NTLM enabled. Now, NTLM, unless you've got, and there's a lot of organizations that do, that do rely on NTLM for authentication to older systems, but really you should be using Kerberos. So what you can do is you can go and audit NTLM usage, work out what applications, what users, what processes are still using NTLM, and you can remediate those. And then eventually you get to the stage where you're removing that less secure protocol and relying on Kerberos. There's other things called um, uh, authentication silos, which is a, a bit more challenging where you're only allowing certain objects to authenticate to other ones. And then there's protected users where you can enable it. And then when you put a user account into that particular container uh, or into that particular group, what it does is it disables things like credential caching. So what you don't wanna do is you don't wanna have, for example, in an administrative users, credentials mm. to be cached because some of the old attacks such as Mimikatz and things like that would go and look through uh, cached credentials and extract those and use the tickets and yeah. then go off and let to move around the network. So there's things that you can do to just, again, harden these accounts that are not there by default. Um, there's Credential Guard, which is basically on specially configured servers. It basically stores credentials in a virtualized container so that, again, it's it's getting away from that sort of mimicats type attack. So it's mm. worth understanding. Um, uh, there's a, a good site called adsecurity.org where the, the, the author of that site goes through all of the attacks against uh, AD and the steps what, that you can take to mitigate those attacks. What was that website called again, just in case anybody missed it real quick? adsecurity.org, I believe, uh, is the name of that website. Okay, well, I might pick that video after to make sure I've got the URL because uh, we'll make sure that we can share that with people because that's like, that sounds like a useful uh, thing for people to get, um, well, to find out about. Um, so if we think about role-based um, conditional access, um, in terms of or, or RBAC, now I always try, this is just my, my other half doesn't work at Microsoft, and uh, sometimes when I go home and I start talking, she goes, I hate you stop using acronyms. So I try to um, always try and say what the thing actually is. Um, but when we think of RBAC um, for administrative tasks on like sensitive hosts, what's a good way of implementing that? Like what, 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 would, what would be Oren's uh, recommendation? So it's, again, a lot of these are, sounds good in theory, but they're actually complicated to implement, <laughs> but any good security is, right? But there's a technology yeah. called Just Enough yeah. Administration. And the way that Just Enough Administration works is that rather than you connecting, let's say, let's say that you wanted to um, do some mucking around with the DNS zones in your environment. Now, all of your DNS zones are hosted on your domain controllers. Now, what you don't want to do is that you don't want the person who's actually accessing the DNS servers to have any privileges within Active Directory. So you kind of don't want them logging onto Active Directory and you probably don't want to figure out exactly what groups and things they want to be a member of. So what JIRA allows you to do is you're, it actually allows you to set it up so that you create an endpoint on the server, a PowerShell endpoint that a 
an unprivileged user that is just a member of a bog standard security group that's got no privileges, you, list, you say you create a new group called uh, Tasmania DNS operators and you give them the permissions to connect to this endpoint and you can configure the endpoint so that an account only needs to be a member of that. They don't need any local admin privileges. But what you can do in configuring that endpoint is you can say, here's all of the PowerShell commands, all of the command line utilities, all the PowerShell functions, all of the parameters, all the values that you can use when you're connected to this endpoint. And then what we'll do is when you're connected to this endpoint, rather than use your own credentials, what we'll do is we'll spin up a temporary virtual account that has local admin permissions, but it only has local admin permissions to use this specific set of commands, parameters, and so on, so that you're extremely limited. So for example, you could have the restart service commandlet, but the only service name that you can restart is the DNS server service that you have the create um, DNS zone commandlet, but you can only use it on this specific DNS zone. So the idea of just enough administration is that you can create these endpoints that you can actually provide people with a particular account and say, go and do DNS operations. And that DNS operation, well, it won't work on any other endpoint except for the DNS endpoint. And when they're connected to the DNS endpoint, they've only got permissions there. So they can't use that to escalate their privileges. And so where you're going further than that is that you, you avoid a Swiss Army Knife account. And the Swiss Army Knife account is one that you'll be very familiar with where you have one admin account and it's got permissions to everything. It can basically manage the SQL servers, Exchange servers, Active Directory, the firewall, the whole thing. Because rather than log in with a Sorry, different you're scaring account me. for each other, <laughs> what you want to do why am I scaring it's you? It's scary. Because because you people people out there, I'm telling you, don't create those admin accounts. Like that is number one advice, right? Don't like if you're the admin, make sure you protect yourself. I'm sorry. That is, you know, where 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 some protection. But, but, so <laughs> if you uh if you want to amuse yourself, before I became an FTE, I recorded a session at Ignite Australia called 30 Terrible Habits of Server Administrators. And that's got a list of all of the worst things that people do, such as, oh, look, we've got service accounts. How can we make us, what are we gonna do with our service accounts? I know, we'll put them in the domain admins group. Because, and the way that the sessions run, and you can hear it because the, it, there's a bit of audience participation. It's like, who knows a consultant that's done the following? Because it's never you that's done it, it's always some other bloke, right? And uh, the whole idea of the session is we know that these are bad practices, yet we also know that there's a lot of people that do them. It's sort of like the old joke about how do you figure out who's got privileged accounts in an environment? And you just do a search of Active Directory users and computers for anybody whose account is set to never expire. Because, yeah. of course, they make everybody else's password expire except those are the privileged accounts because they got sick of changing their passwords. <laughs> well, I think, you know, I was going to talk to you about how you protect, um, you know, accounts and, and things, but I think let's talk about um, how we protect, I suppose, the internal infrastructure of servers that, you know, what steps can we do for that? And then I think maybe we'll talk about some, you know, maybe what we do with VMs afterwards. Um, I think that they're sort of, I mean, I've joined two questions together there, but they're my two questions. How do we do the, how do we do the real environment? How do we do the virtual environment? So... Well, and a lot of your infrastructure servers, of course, are going to be running as VMs anyway. So it is sort of like part one and part two of that question. But yeah. one thing to consider where appropriate is domain isolation policies. So they're not enabled by default. And all a domain isolation policy does is it says that every server or every host that connects to me must authenticate. So rather than letting every, anything that's basically got an IP address or from the DHCP server, or if someone's, you know, hard coded an IP address, go and communicate with everything, you actually require every host on the network to authenticate in some way. It might be certificate based authentication. It might be something simple as password, it's passphrase, but it's basically employing the equivalent of IPSEC policies. But it's, I mean, you can, and you can turn on IPSEC or you can just say, allow the connection, don't encrypt it, but make sure every connection is authenticated. So where appropriate for file servers, 
for and if you, you, you use certificate based authentication, you can set it up so that they can't communicate with a DC unless you know you've installed a certificate on that host. So the advantage is if a, a host is compromised, you just go to your CA and then you just revoke yeah. that certificate. And then suddenly that host can't go and authenticate. So domain isolation policies using server core where appropriate. Again, your DNS and your DHCP servers and your file servers don't need to be sitting there with that full stack GUI on them. For the most part, they can get away with running server core and then you're remotely administering them using Windows Admin Center or you're using the appropriate Microsoft Management Console or the appropriate PowerShell tools or Azure Arc if you're using that methodology to go and manage them. Mm. But you again, you want to restrict the, you make sure that there are no services running. You make sure that there are no roles installed on that server that don't need to be there. And we've got so much resources in terms of um, RAM and disk space and the vast majority of Windows infrastructure servers at the moment don't require you to be sitting, I mean, obviously if you're running SQL or something like that as an application server, that's a different kettle of fish. But if you're thinking about yeah. a bog standard file server, does your bog standard file server need 64 gig of RAM? Probably not. So you can sit there and put these servers on, into your virtualization fabric and yeah. you can actually really restrict the size of it. And server core obviously reduces the footprint as well. Um, then you, again, with infrastructure service, you do with what you did with domain controllers, you restrict the hosts that are actually allowed to perform administrative connections to them. You say, right, I'm not going to accept any PowerShell connections from any yeah. host other than the ones that are on this particular subnet or these particular IP addresses that I know are the admin workstation IP addresses. Um, so you make sure that you do that as well, because what you again don't want to do is when attackers get into your network, what they're trying to do is they're trying to get persistence. They're trying to find a nice perch to sit on while they recon yeah. your network and understand how it works. And what you don't want to do is once they're on that perch, that they can get everywhere in the network from that perch. And a lot of attacks where the attack has been very successful is that the, the modality that people are thinking on is that they're thinking like everybody bad is out there. Everybody good yeah. is in here. So we're going to trust everybody yeah. in here. But what you should be doing is you should actually say, well, we don't know that we could trust everybody in here. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a minimal way of determining that they actually are who they should be or that if a particular yeah. host is compromised, we're going to minimize the chance so that if they do get control over a file server, they can't RDP from the file server to the domain controller because the only thing that can RDP to the domain controller, the only thing that can make a Windows admin server connection to the domain controller is specific admin workstations. So, yeah, I mean, I, I've got some, my, my summary, I think you've just helped me with my summary there. So that's perfect, or that was the perfect explanation. Um, I think people need to be aware of all the options and, and not be, not, Take responsibility and authenticate. Like that's that's the that's that's kind of what my layman's ears is hearing is actually, you know, don't make assumptions that it's you know just because you've kind of put your firewall up, happy days. Um, you know, people are gonna people are gonna be sneaky, and you've got to make sure that you've got enough doors between all the rooms in the house to make sure you're protected. Um, so um, yeah, like that's. And what would you say? I suppose and, last and question. Matter of and it's a matter Sorry. of finding a balance because you can yeah. go down a rabbit hole with security where you're doing all of this insane stuff, but you don't do that if you're looking after the local primary school servers because the yeah. security requirements to the local primary school are a bit different to the local bank. Um, there's places that yeah. you can go such as uh, the NIST website um, or if you go and look for the security technical implementation guides where you can get good military level third party assistance on every security option that you can turn on <coughs> and what their recommendation mm. is about those options. And then you figure out where do you fit on that particular scale. Yeah, and I, su I suppose it's exactly that. It's, it's just the right amount for you and you kind of need to go and figure that out and you need to spend some time in investing in understanding what that is before you go start turning things on and off, but make sure if you're going to turn things on and off that you actually are working at the right level for your business or company or school or, you know, yeah, hospital and, or whatever. And you, have that, and you have that conversation with your management chain in the, you say, mm -hmm. well, look, if we get compromised, these are the steps that we talk. 
And these, you know, we got compromised. It, again, when we had some of the, um, the, the, the worms that came through, um, there's a great book, but, um, I can't remember what the author, but it's called Sandworm. And it's all about the, and he actually goes through in quite good detail about what happened to Maersk's active directory environment. But there was also, you know, when we had some of those attacks that, have, uh, uh, that, that impacted hospitals all over the world, where yeah. older systems were sitting there, but you also had the quite rational response of hospital administrators saying, look, do we go and spend half a million dollars or half a million pounds on securing the hospital's network, or do we go and buy a new CT scanner? Because one of these helps our patients and the other, well, you know, we we're just kind of recover. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, like, you know, and you're, and you're, and you're right. You know, at the, at the end of the day, like people, especially when you think about someone like healthcare, where there's a finite level of investment, then, then those decisions have to be made. Um, what would you say? I suppose this is my last question. Any other good admin habits, just, you know, um, that you, that you would tell anybody um, down the pub, um, obviously, if we were down the pub, we wouldn't be talking about this. Let's be honest. We'd be talking about much more exciting things like Warhammer. Um, but uh, the, if, if, if we were in the pub and we were talking security, um, you know, what good admin habits would, would you would you be telling me uh, over, a, over a cold brew? Um, I would be absolutely making sure that I had a separate computer for performing my admin tasks. The, that's one of yeah. those things that you've got to have an argument with whoever's in charge of your system. And it might be that you've got a jump server and it might be that you've got a jump server that's sitting somewhere that gets nuked every couple of days and then gets rebuilt from a script because that way you know it's safe and then you limit who can go and connect. Make sure that you have separate, separate daily driver and admin accounts. Um, yeah. When I got... Um, when I moved out of working as a sysadmin at a university, I went and worked at a, into private enterprise and I had a bloke come to me and I was in my first week and he said, um, can you reset the password on my, uh, my account? Cause I've forgotten it. And I was on a call with a, a vendor at the time. And I said, yeah, yeah, I'll get to it in half an hour. And he comes back after half an hour and says, don't worry about it. And I said, what do you mean? Don't worry about it. And he said, oh, I've got a backup account. And I just logged in with that and reset it using that. And I said, how many backup accounts are sitting in this system? And he said, oh, well, we might need them. So that's not a good security practice at all. So make sure that you actually know <laughs> what accounts are there. And then yeah. really pare down accounts so that instead of having Swiss Army knife accounts, that, yeah, okay, if you need to go and open the drawer and pick up the account used to manage DNS, you go and pick up that account and you use that. And then you go and put that back in the drawer, you shut the drawer, you open the drawer, and then you go and pick up the file server account. And yes, it's more cumbersome and figure out what the balance is in your environment. Maybe if you're a, a one person shop, that makes a little less sense. But what you're trying to do is you're trying to figure out how do I limit the damage an account can do if it's compromised? How do I limit the damage that can occur if this host is compromised? Fair. Um, and you know what? That pint was great as well. So, um, although you have those little small beers in Australia, though you don't have like full pints over there, do you? I don't know. I, I, when you see them on like on, on the TV, they're always drinking those little beers um, over in Australia. So, it, so, in each state, there's a different name for what's a pot, what's a schooner, what's a midi, what's a yard glass. Of course, we used to have yeah. the Prime Minister of Australia who was in the Guinness Book of Records when he was Ox at Oxford for the fastest drinker of uh, a yard glass in history. And he actually held that for uh, several decades. So that was a guy named Bob Hawke. So, um, but again, it's much more, the, the, beer cup, the beer here is obviously much more influenced by the UK than it is America, although, um, if I remember correctly, you guys don't have cold beers because, of course, you don't have warm weather. So, uh, you know, again, <laughs> there needs to be well, balances and uh, adjustments made. <laughs> that's okay. I, I, we'll have to sort you out with some ale. Um, then uh, that's what so that's what we'll have to. Do. Um, so anyway, so move swiftly on. Uh, we always have a little bit of fun in the show um, because um, t you know too too much tech. For anybody uh, is is just too much so we have a little bit of fun uh which is we do a meme review now you've already warned me that our memes are very dad joke and 
I'll be honest, I'm I'm not a cool bloke. I know I'm not a cool bloke, right? Like I'm, you know, I'm like, I, I freely admit it. Um, and um, yeah, I've got, um, you know, dad dancing skills and dad meme jokes, right? But um, let's see the first meme. <laughs> I mean, the... <laughs> It's hide the pain, Harold. Um, so um, again, yeah, with systems administration memes, there's some pretty yeah. dark stuff because systems administrators are, tend to have very dark humor. And I remember the first place I worked, they had the um, the train spotting sysadmin meme, which obviously you can't repeat on a podcast because it's basically <coughs> it's, it's a Begbie speech from train spotting, where uh, or Ewan McGregor's speech from train spotting except yeah. that it's translated into systems administrators, but it's very much 90 systems administrators where everybody got around looking like that they were re reject from a sort of a, a, a goth concert or something like that. <laughs> so... Uh, I had that poster on my so, wall uh, when I was a kid. But this one, it, it fixed yeah. one minor bug, the entire server crashes, and they've also just, they're taking <laughs> the producers are taking <laughs> because that is definitely a dad as well. He, like, they, they are, honestly, who does this stuff? They've done it on purpose, haven't they? <laughs> no, I mean, yeah. Look, I mean, if you you don't, you only have to look around the internet to find some really. Um, my, my favorite one is uh, obviously I haven't seen it there. Is you know the the um, the ancient aliens guys, and he's like, yeah. they say it wasn't DNS, <laughs> but of course it was DNS, right? Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Okay, well, let, let's. Um, I didn't really warn you about this one, so the reaction we were just talking about other stuff. But um, let's get the second one. Let's get your your reaction to the second one. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that, that lady. Has okay, got... you, you think that's funny? Now, I when I was working <laughs> at Killer uh, University in the nineteen nineties. I was working in a, well, I can actually, I was working in a department of philosophy, anthropology, and history of science. And yeah. we had an admin assistant. And this is, so this is the early 90s. We're, we're talking about 93, 94. And the yeah. admin assistant was um, elderly. And their, their general responsibility was typing. And they'd only been shifted off a typewriter recently onto a word processor. And every <coughs> night, this person diligently covered their, PC in a dust cover and everything. Bless this person. And I, I asked, why are you doing that? And the person honestly responded, and I don't want the computer to get a virus. And there was a professor of anthropology standing behind me. And we watched this person leave. And he went, no, this is not stupidity. It's just a, a, a case of metaphors not being understood. And that this admin person has understood viruses as something that be, can be transmitted. So has naturally thought that a human could transmit a virus to a computer. Uh, maybe so, one day, um, you know, we've got the matrix behind you. So maybe we're all just living in the matrix. So it could be true. Well, that's what Neil Stevenson and Elon Musk seem to think is that we're all living in a matryoshka <laughs> reality. So why not, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, look, whatever, whatever gives you the justification to do whatever you want to do in life. Do you know what I mean? Um, so, <laughs> look, Oren, it's been amazing talking to you today. Um, thank you so much. Um, as ever with the audience, if you want to ask a question, if you want us to go find uh, an Oren, and I think we're definitely going to have you on again because um, talking to you has been absolutely fascinating. Um, but, um, yeah, like if you want us to talk about a particular thing or you like the meme or whatever, drop a comment. Let us know. We will try to do what we can do and get you your your questions to an expert. Now, uh, I'm just going to summarize really quick, um, which, um, you know, I think the reality is there's no such thing as, as, as greenfield sites anymore. It's, you know, there's there's all that existing technology and what's happening in the cloud. And people have got to find the right levels of um, appropriate uh, security and they've got to have just enough for their needs and they've got to do their research before they go and turn things on and off, but they've got to take that responsibility themselves. And the main thing that I put on here in my big note is authenticate where appropriate. Um, and I think that is, is the, I suppose, the key thing that I've taken away for, for hardening, um, hardening your servers. 
Cool. Yeah, cool. So I did. So I did listen, and I did learn something. So it was definitely worth. That's one person converted, Oren. So that's you've done. You've done your your job for today. Um, thank you. Um, well, uh, um, as always, um, massive thank you for watching. Um, and if you like, I said, if you want to know more, do let me know. This has been Tom, and this has been Oren. Oren, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, um, and um, we've, we've thoroughly enjoyed our time together, and um, we will see you soon on another episode from The Rock to the Cloud. Thanks a lot. Cheers, everybody. Bye.